aquí corriendo. It's more fun to cross here running, making fun of the border patrol. I have papers, my sneakers are my papers. This is the biggest waiting room in Mexico, the waiting room for a short dash across the dried up Tijuana River and into the United States. What, what is that up there? That's Mexico, right there. That's there? the levee. Let's walk over there and see what they're screaming at my agents for. Cola, do me a favor. Kill my vehicle and bring the The weekend key. is always the busiest time for Border Patrol agent Roland Gonzalez. We are being invaded by a, a lot of people. Every Friday and Saturday night, the crowd on the Tijuana River levee grows so large that it becomes pointless to hide from the Border Patrol. At nightfall, it usually gives the bonsai rush. You get 20 guys coming across, you got four agents. That's five per agent, we hope. They come across at shift change time, right? Right. So, so what's going to happen? You're going to fake them out? Yeah, we're doing it just a tad bit early. The agents that are working it are pulling out. They're going to hide. We're going to wait till the group starts moving north, then we're going to come back south, try to catch as many as we can. See them climbing over that wall now? Look at them. Like ants off a hot plate. 218, let's go. What's happening? Let's go. It's like the border in this part of America. The border is, uh, it might as well be made out of Swiss cheese. Well, it's, it's very porous and, and people keep pouring through. After we've done this, they get all fired up on the south side. catch 540,000, there's a possibility that a million people escaped last year from us. Harold Beasley is the assistant chief of the San Diego sector. If this is a battle, who's winning? They are. We're losing. But one person who has no time to keep score of who's winning and who's losing is Maria, whom 48 Hours hooked up with earlier as she began her journey to California. There's more grass here, less chance of the helicopter seeing us. It's the enemy. It's so ugly to call them that. She knows we're going to the United States, but she's just a little girl. Back at the levee, it's time for another shift change, but this time the Border Patrol is not hiding or waiting. It's only a short run to the freeway. The highway north is now a rendezvous point for smugglers and their human cargo, and for all practical purposes, a safe haven from the Border Patrol. The yellow signs we'll see up here are warning the people that there's going to be people running across the freeway from either side, women and children and whatever. You see this group right here with the lady and her little kids right here walking. They may be safe from the Border Patrol, but not from speeding cars. If we pull over, and try to work traffic on either side of the freeway or in the middle, the people are gonna run from us. And when they run from us, they take a big chance of getting hit by a car. In four years, more than 120 people have been killed crossing the freeway. I can't see into the future, but I still see as long as there's poor countries in the world and they think of America as the, the land of milk and honey where there's gold, paved everywhere, we're going to get people trying to come into our country. We have people coming in that they can't find food or work. We can't afford to pay for everybody. We, we, we just can't. 
It would be good if Americans realized that all this hiding and illegal entry is causing death and tragedy. For Maria, the trek has just ended. Only minutes from the highway to Los Angeles, she and her daughter and some others have been caught. After all this walking and all this effort, getting caught by the Border Patrol would be like death. I would rather get beaten up and left here than have to do this all over again. And tomorrow, when it gets dark, the desperate journey will begin all over again for thousands upon thousands of others who are also looking for a better life. Next, the long and the short of speed skating. It's it, and that's that. <laughs> It's it, and that's that. It's it, and that's that. Nothing beats it. You want the bar across the street. <laughs> Life's the great beer that's less filling. It's everything you want a beer to be. It's it, and that's that. This winter at Albertville, short track speed skating will be a medal event for the first time. Skaters race in a pack around an indoor rink with some of the thrills and spills of roller derby. Short track, long on excitement, is expected to become very popular. Miller Lite is a sponsor of the Winter Olympics broadcast on CBS. Akira would like to pose the following question. Could your heart benefit from the use of another 24 valves? The Acura Legend Coupe. I have a confession. I have no idea how to choose a long distance calling plan. I don't have to. Sprint does it for me. They keep track of when and where I call and actually let me know which calling plan will save me the most money. They do all that just because I'm a Sprint Priority customer. And I thought it was because I was their spokesperson. Ladies and gentlemen, the Duchesnais. They don't just ice dance, they ice dazzle. <laughs> The reigning world champions who set the competitive standard. From France, the breathtaking sister and brother team of Isabelle and Paul Duchesnay. The Olympic Winter Games are coming to CBS. Watch them melt the ice and share a moment with the world. is the killing of one human being by another, either lawfully or unlawfully. About the only thing that Korean-born Soon Ja Do and 15-year-old Latasha Harlins had in common was that they both were trying to make their dreams come true in this poor, crime-infested section of Los Angeles. That was my granddaughter. Latasha lived here with her grandmother and aunt, Ruth and Denise Harlins. Oh, Lord. I mean, it just hurted me so I just... Ooh. Oh, he just hurted me deeply. I feel like I'm in a, a nightmare. Uh, I don't know why things are happening this way. Mrs. Du and her family don't live in the neighborhood, but like many Koreans, they own a business here. Last March, the two cultures collided in the Du's liquor store. This security tape has no audio. What you're about to see is graphic. Latasha approaches the counter with a bottle of orange juice in her backpack. Mrs. Du believes the teenager is shoplifting and grabs Latasha's sweater. Latasha punches Mrs. Du and knocks her down. Mrs. Du throws a stool at Latasha. As Latasha retrieves the orange juice from the floor, Mrs. Du gets a gun from under the counter and fires a single shot into the back of Latasha's head. 
killing her instantly. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. Almost as quickly as the scuffle over an orange juice bottle escalated. You shouldn't tell this man to keep his mouth shut. Simmering tensions between the two communities boiled over. We want justice. Why don't you open a market that we can use for our family? Go back to Korea. The Korean population in the Los Angeles area exploded from 70,000 to 180,000 in just 10 years. Today, 44% own small businesses. Whatever the nationality is, whatever ethnic group it is, we are not going to stand idly by and see anybody come into our own neighborhood, and into our own backyard and front yard, and establish an economic monopoly and not respond to it. What frustrates me most is just the fact that my parents, my brothers, they work their butts off. They work 14 hours a day. My Mrs. Dew's daughter, life. Sandy, and her family okay, talked to 48 hours in their lawyer's office. They say they were robbed three times, burglarized 40 times, and their son beaten up in the two years they've owned the store. And if this is what we get, this is not what we pictured America to be, you know? We always pictured America to be, if we work, we get what we sow, you know? Did anyone warn you that there might be problems uh, adjusting to the community? That was something small. What was big was just opening the store and getting it together. We, f we thought people are people anywhere. Soon Jadu was charged with murder. Supporters of both sides packed the courtroom. The witnesses will testify. You could clearly see the orange juice as she walked up to the counter. Deputy District Attorney the Roxanne Carvajal argues that Latasha was not shoplifting. Latasha turns around to show her the backpack, to show her the orange juice that's sticking out. She has money in her hand. Defense attorney Charles Lloyd maintains the shooting was in self-defense and accidental. And then the young girl picks up the orange juice and said, Bitch, I told you I was going to kill you. Mrs. Dew finally gets the gun out of the holster. And standing there trembling, the gun accidentally goes off. Natasha was the ultimate in the family. She was the center of attraction, center of, of our hearts, and she, everyone here looked up to Natasha. She was always a motivated, strong individual that loved her family. Mrs. Dew had never seen Natasha in the store before, but assumed she was a gang member. She was, she was so big, and, and she was so tall, and her punch was so hard. She was so big, and she was so tall, and her punch was so hard. I didn't think she was 15, but when I realized that, my heart ached. She's filled with sorrow that she's, she has passed away. They don't know anything about us, our culture, our heritage, who we are, what we are. Why do you think Mrs. Du shot Latasha? The fact that Latasha was a black girl. Because if it was an Asian or a white person, I don't believe that that woman would have shot um, no other child. Since this ordeal, if you had an opportunity to ever block, to buy property in an African-American community again, do you think that was wrong to do, or would you do it again? No way. No way. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. After four days of intense deliberation, the jury reaches a verdict. Would the clerk please read the verdict? Manslaughter, not murder. For Mrs. Du, it could mean less prison time or none at all. Too late. What do you think? She got away with murder. Do you understand why the African American community may have reacted the way it did? No. You don't. No, I don't. For many minorities, the melting pot is a myth. America is, instead, a mosaic, whose pieces don't always fit together. The shooting has left the Dews and the Harlands wondering where they fit into the picture. I feel like we had a lot of dreams when we came to America. And we lost everything in that short amount of period, and that doesn't seem right to me. Mrs. Dew received no prison time. She got probation, a light fine, and 400 hours of community service.
Coming up on Eyewitness News, President Bush is battling the flu that caused him to collapse today in Tokyo. We'll have an update on the president's condition. Virginia Governor Doug Wilder makes a surprise announcement and pulls out of the presidential race. And the Terps duke it out at Cole Fieldhouse tonight. The news is next. to making batteries that last, somebody's in high gear, Duracell. Today's Duracell batteries can even outperform the ones we made just a few years back. You can't top the copper top. Uh, uh, you're gonna... Um, um, uh, uh... EPT, the most trusted name in home pregnancy test works in just minutes. A baby. EPT, the fast, easy way to get the big news. Cool. <laughs> if this is a cold, this is the flu. Metaflu, maximum strength relief in a convenient caplet. For more than a cold, for the flu. Metaflu. In the Atlantic Ocean, under a blazing hot sun, someplace between Cuba and the United States, the U.S. Coast Guard spots a styrofoam raft floating helplessly, carrying a tired, thirsty refugee who is risking his life to get out of Cuba. He is asking the Cuban, are you the only one out there or is someone else with you? It turns out the man is not alone. On the floor of the raft, there is someone else, a young boy, a 15-year-old named Gregorio Perez. Gregorio is still breathing, but he's too weak. Before he can start a new life in Miami, Gregorio Perez will die. And he was not the first one that had died uh, while attempting to reach freedom uh, via the Florida Strait in a raft. It's an Apache. At the time, we got together a few friends and Six, started nine. talking about uh, doing or, uh, something about what was seven, going on. Five, what Jose Pizzulto, a Cuban refugee himself, is doing, along with okay. some friends, Sector, uh, is flying Sector. private planes searching for refugees at sea. They call themselves Brothers to the Rescue. When they spot refugees, they call the Coast Guard. So if your plane weren't up there, what would happen to some of these people? I'm pretty sure they would die. The likelihood to be found is very small. A one out of four makes it out. Cubans are fleeing in anything that floats. More men and women and children risked their lives last year than in the previous 10 years combined. That can give you an idea and a measure of the desperation level inside of Cuba, which is suicidal. It's a big ocean, and the boats and rafts are so small. They are not easy to find. But on this day, Jose Bazulto sees something. Refugees pinning their hopes on the wind. A very small vessel with a small sail. And I believe three occupants on board. I have to check that. Stand by. It has four or five persons on board. Inside the boat, three men and two women. Bazulto throws them some water and a map. Look at that! <laughs> Good water delivery. <laughs> Before nightfall, three boats with 16 people will be spotted, and everyone on board will be rescued. When Cubans are picked up at sea, they are taken to a federal detention center in Miami. That's where we met the five people Bizulto spotted from the air, and a father and son rescued from another boat that same day. One of the refugees was carrying the map Bizulto dropped from his plane. Bienvenidos. Welcome. What would have happened if that plane didn't come over just when it did? What would have happened to all of you? We would have lived for four or five hours more. How many days were you out at sea? Three days. Three days. Three days. We were just waiting for God to save us. Cuban refugees officially are classified as political, not economic refugees, because they're fleeing a communist dictatorship. So unlike the others making the desperate journey to the United States, the Cubans can stay. All they need is a relative or group to take them in. This year, this is the third time he tried to leave Cuba on a raft or a boat and a highly organized Cuban-American community in Miami spreads the word of the new arrivals. Emilio de Armas, Marlene Mato Ginza, but today, there is an amazing discovery. 
Two of the people rescued whose names have been read are the father and brother of a young boy who tried to make it nearly two years ago. This boy, Gregorio, whom we saw earlier and who died at 15, trying to escape to the United States. Out of the six people you rescued in the raft yesterday, uh -huh. you rescued a father and a brother. Uh -huh. The father and the brother of the first rafter who died in Miami in 1988. Of Gregorio, Gregorio 1990. This is the dead boy's brother, Daniel, and this is his father, Orlando. I lost a son here, and I made myself a mission to come here and go to his grave to see him. America has always been a haven for people wanting a better life. Emilio de Armas wanted a better life, too. Eleven years ago, he tried to leave Cuba with his family in the Mariel boat lift. The Cuban authorities let the others go, but not Emilio. For some, the desperate journey ends in tragedy at sea. For others... It ends this way. Unlike Emilio, most refugees from nearby Haiti are considered economic, not political, and have been turned back. Then came the September coup and deadly rampages by the Haitian military. More than 8,000 Haitians fled, they say, to escape the violence, not just the poverty. Most of them are still being held at Guantanamo Naval Base after a judge ordered federal officials to make sure no one is sent back who might be persecuted. An appeals court will consider the Haitians' fate in two weeks. That's 48 Hours for this week. I'm Dan Rather. Tomorrow night, don't miss the premiere of Street Stories, anchored by Ed Bradley. Stories gritty and real from big cities and small towns, down the streets where you live. That's tomorrow at 9, 8 Central and Mountain for Street Stories. Coming up here next, your late local news. But first, here's a look ahead to our next report.